Hello everyone, I'm Tony, the Scar Ghost, and I'm here uh, making a special interview this day with Alvin Wang Grayling, the president of Vive China and president of VRVCA, a very important investment fund of China. I'm very excited for this interview. I tried to ask him a lot of questions about VR uh, Vive devices in China. I'm uh, also very happy because I'm a bit a fan of his. Uh, follow him on social media and sometimes we have the occasion to talk about. So thank you, uh, Mr. Wang, for this opportunity. <coughs> Thanks, Anthony, for inviting me. I uh, look forward to an interesting conversation. Well, uh, let's start talking about Vive devices because we're all very interested by, about them. Um, <coughs> I. Uh, in December, you presented yourself the Vive Focus. You are on stage with this amazing device in your hand. Uh, we were all excited about it, uh, seeing its instant on feature, the room scalability, and uh, all this amazing stuff, the great display, for instance. But I met I and other innovators were quite disappointed by the, the controller because we all dreamed about Six degree of freedom controllers with which grab objects, move objects in space, and play maybe job simulator without cables. So, why you chose this uh, form factor for the controller? It is because the price, difficulties in tracking system of controllers, or what's the reason? Yeah, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, what we want to do is create a product that um, is very usable, it's very stable, and will you know, meet the needs of as many users as possible at a reasonable price. So trying to create a balance uh, of all of those needs is uh, is not easy. And, uh, you know, we do need to, to make some compromises. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, we looked very, very hard at, at making Sixsoft controllers available right away. Um, but the maturity of the current technology just wasn't there to create a stable experience. You know, some, some technologies uh, work well in certain scenarios and not in others, or took a lot of setup or required a lot of recalibration. And rather than, than having to create a confusing confusing experience for our users, uh, we, we uh, decided to go with a more traditional 3DOP controller. Now, I do want to point out that even though we use a 3DOP uh, a controller with hardware for 3DOP, it actually has uh, the ability to, to simulate some movement that gives you a feel for 6DOP. Now it's not as accurate, of course, as a you know, laser uh, track device, but for normal things, let's say a shooting game, or or for you know, let's say um, you know, basic gaming, it actually can give you a sense of six dots. In fact, last week um, I was uh, demoing the, the device uh, with uh, Tony Parisi from uh, Unity, who has seen just about every device out there, and you know, he after playing with it for less than a minute, he said, hey. Uh, this product is, is, is a winner, you know, and, and he, he mainly posted it on, on, tw on Twitter, I think he said this is, is really, really good. And, uh, you know, coming from him, I, I, uh, I'm actually very uh, satisfied that, that he thought the experience of, the, of that, you know, that device is worth his endorsement. Right? And that's an unsolicited endorsement. Um, uh, you talk about the, the problem of offering great experience. For instance, there is a partner of yours that is Pico that has made the Neo with two six of controllers. And I've seen from the review, I see, yes, that there were problems in the tracking or reliable tracking of these controllers. So I think that uh, I understand completely the, the reasonings you made. Anyway, I hope that in the future maybe the Vive Focus 2 will have to six of controllers, so uh, we can have a premium their experience. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think I think you 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 know you will get your wish. Uh, it's just a matter of time. Um, I think when we do find a a, uh, a solution that is stable enough, uh, we you know we would like to to bring six stop to mobile VR. So that I think you know everybody everybody is after the same goal of, of creating as as uh, full an experience as possible. Uh, on the, the, the standalone devices. Okay, uh, as I said, uh, I'm really interested in this device, but unluckily uh, I'm not Chinese. So um, you, you, I read in the press release that maybe the, the device will be released in the West. 
Uh, honestly, I don't want to hear maybe. I want to know when will be released in the web because <laughs> I really want to uh, be able to try it. Uh, so when will our Western people be able to try the white focus, to buy the white focus? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not at the privilege right now to release to give release dates, but uh, you know, it is something that we are looking at very seriously, and uh, once we have. Uh, you know, more clear market data in terms of how things are doing with the Chinese release. Um, you know, I, I don't see any reason why we would not uh, release it in the rest of the world. Okay, so it's a business choice. You want to see how it, is go it goes in China, and if the device sells well in China, then you surely uh, release it even in Western <laughs> countries. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, say I surely, but I think uh, it is definitely uh, our, our intent that, you know, we, if, if we have a good product, then it should be available to as many users as possible. Okay, uh, <coughs> then uh, let's talk about the competition of the right focus. Uh, we all know that Oculus is working on the Oculus Santa Cruz from at least one year. Um, HTS and other company like Lenovo has released the uh, Mirage Solo. Uh, the Mirage Solo is a bit worse than the White Focus, but it's cheaper. And the Oculus Santa Cruz, we don't know anything about it, but we know that we'll have this of control. My question is, how do you plan to compete with these devices? So what's why Focus uh, is in the whole for fighting against this competition? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would almost say I, I'm not, I don't see these, these products as, you know, competing with each other. I, I think we're in such an early stage in the industry right now that rather than seeing each other as competitors, I really see us as all trying to listen to help meet the needs of users uh, who want to use VR and make it as popular as possible. I mean, if, oh, last month we had announced the, the Five Wave program uh, where we brought in 12 of our, you know, some people would call competitors from our industry to, to join us in, in sharing, you know, creating this shared goal of, of uh, making, making VR accessible to as many people as possible and making high quality content accessible to as many possible. So all the work that we've been doing to develop the, the development base, the content base, uh, you know, we'll share with these other hardware vendors because we want them to uh, to be able to have access to good content. And we want people with their experiences with VR to be a positive experience, right? So we're gonna make Viport and all the content on it available to all of these uh, device manufacturers. And uh, so again, I, I, I don't think we need to worry about, you know, uh, competing. I think if, if, you know, everybody does the best they can in making a good product, you know, the, the customers will choose, the, the end users will, use, will choose which device they will, they will go with. Um, you know, we're, we're not trying to be the price leader, right? We're not trying to go do the, the $200 range of a product that has, has minimal features. We, we want to make sure that anybody that puts on a device, uh, they know that they can expect the best experience that's available at that class, at that category. Okay, great. So um, I'm over with the question with the right focus, and let's talk about the CES most interesting product. I've seen that you won a bazillion awards there. So <laughs> <laughs> really, congratulations. I think that you had some problems in carrying all those prizes with you on the plane. Um, there is. There are some questions that we all are making about the Vive Pro, so I think that won't be that original, but I hope to understand better something. And the first is really maybe the one of the most tougher questions is about the controller, because everyone is talking about there will be knuckles, there won't be knuckles, knuckles are made by Valve, not by HTC, by HTC and Valve are partners and uh, all, all this reasoning together. Uh, then Rotovr say that uh, Vive XX has said that won't be knuckles in, with Vive Pro, at least at the beginning. So can you officially confirm that won't be, or is it something that you're still thinking about? Yeah, I mean, uh, as, as you mentioned in, in your uh, question, 
the knuckle controller is something that is being developed by uh, by Valve, and uh, you know we, we don't control the release timing or date or specs of that product. Um, at our current, uh, uh, based on our current plans, we do not expect that the Vive Knuckles will be part of the initial release. Uh, but once it is available, there's no reason why we would not include it uh, for a customer that want to, you know, to buy that additional capability. Okay, so in the future, it could be a bundle of Vive Pro and Knuckles together, but most probably at the beginning, this won't be the case. If I understand, com yeah, correctly. yeah. I mean, you know, I, you know, because we're we're two different companies that are building things at different times, timelines. So uh, it, it's it's uh, very uh, it would be unusual for us to actually be able to release products at exactly the same time. Yeah, um, but so you're going to release the right power with HTC controllers. How these controllers? Uh, how will be? It will be just like the Vive. Original Vive controllers just with the sense of change, or you're going to make some form factor changes, so maybe to give us the fingers, so some kind of HTC knuckles while we wait for the Vive knuckles. Yeah, I, I think I think the, uh, if you wait a little while, there will be more information that will publicly be available about um, you know, the controllers and the and the 2.0 Lighthouse uh, tracking. But uh, at this point, you know we're uh, we, I think what we showed at the CES was really just the, the head mount only solution, and it was using the 1.0 uh, controllers and the 1.0 lighthouse. So, um, you know, that's something I also want to emphasize that anybody who already has a current buy today, uh, there's no uh, there's no need to actually buy another lighthouse or another controller for it to work with the, the Pro. It, it is fully backwards compatible to the existing uh, tracking system and controller. Now, uh, you know, when we do uh, have the new, new tracking systems available, uh, at that point, uh, we will also make uh, controllers available. But the first batch of sales will actually be uh, kind of early access for our existing Vive users so that they can be the first ones in the world to, uh, to try out the, the Vive Pro. Okay, great. And Another question regards uh, the two cameras that are in front of the Vive Pro. We are all thinking about micro reality, augmented reality applications, and such. My question is, why do you decide to use two cameras? It is something that you yourself, as HTC, are planning to use in the future, or it's something that you put there for the developers for possible future uses? Yeah, I, I think you just answered our question. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, giving new capabilities to our developers and to the community uh, will actually create a lot of solutions that we didn't expect. You know, last year when we released the Vive Tracker, uh, we didn't know that you know right away somebody would make that uh, a full body tracking system with it, yeah. and then you bring your bring your whole feet and your body into the yard. you know, and people are putting it onto their pets so that they don't kick them while they're walking around in the yard. So, um, you know, I think these. The, those cameras will will be uh, accessible in terms of developers to create some interesting solutions with it. Of course, we have our own engineers that are working on some uh, fun uses as well. Um, and when they are available, we will make sure that uh, you know we'll let the, the public know about them. Okay, so no spoilers about what your engineers are doing with them. <laughs> yeah, sorry, not not at this time. We we have uh, you know, NDAs and such. I know, I know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, last question about the Vive Pro is another popular question is about the price. I know that you can't tell me the price and the release date because of NDAs and such, but I hope that you can at least give me an order of magnitude of it because some people said it will cost, uh, it's for professionals, it costs thousands of dollars. Others say no, it will be very cheap to compete with the Oculus Rift. So, can we have at least an order of magnitude of the prices we can expect, because just to, to start beginning, if you can afford it or not. <laughs> um, I, I can't give you any specifics, but I will say that in, in the very near future, uh, pricing information will be released, and uh, I think at that point, you'll have uh, all your questions answered. But of course, you know, as you said, it is a, a uh, product targeted towards the prosumer or the professional users. So with any any 
product targeted towards a professional user, it will be more expensive than the existing consumer product. Okay. Uh, and about the world tour, everyone is saying that it is like a Vive 1.5 because it's an evolution of the Vive. It's like um, you take how the Vive would have been if it was released in 2018. And it's amazing. But we all are waiting and talking about uh, under the hood about Vive 2 that maybe will come next year and such. So um, I know that 95% of what you're doing for the possible Vive 2 will be under NDA and uh, you can't say most of things but my question is what can we, what can you say that you are allowed to say about <laughs> the possible Vive 2? That will be a Vive yeah. 2. Uh, what Features can we expect, and it will be disruptive as the Vive One, because the Vive One has changed completely the virtual reality ecosystem. So, can we expect something like that in the Vive Two? I mean, I, I, I can't talk about specs at all, as you know. Oh, but you know, at the end of the day, what, whatever product we release, it, 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 we, you know, our goal is to make sure that at that time it is the best possible product available, and we set the standard for what premium VR means. Um, so, you know, uh, I think you can uh, you can look at the, 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 the specs and capabilities at whatever time that it comes out. Um, that it, you know, we, we would expect our, our customers to, to see it as the the premium product that's out there on the market. So, uh, other than that, I probably can't uh, can't say too much. Okay. I think that you're working on all the features we are thinking about, like eye tracking, etc. But it's it's a pity that you can't tell me more. So I'm very curious. Yeah, but I mean, a, a lot of the things that you're talking about actually are available as third-party add-ons today uh, for for the Vive or the Vive Pro. So um, you know, so I, I I you know, for people who really need to have access to specific specific capabilities, uh, there are third-party solutions that can uh, you know, uh, augment whatever solutions that we have. Yes, so for things for eye tracking, you're talking about Toby, for instance, that is, has an add-on for HTC Vive? Yeah, I mean, I think Toby did one, SMI did one, but you know, there's also 7 and Benson, which has a specific plug-in that, you know, for a couple hundred dollars, you can plug it in and have, have uh, eye tracking today. You know, with with full VR rendering. Right. Okay, and about the far future, uh, we've seen talking about the competitor. We've seen months ago the photos of Mark Zuckerberg going to the Oculus research with his T-shirt okay. while everyone had white vests and such. And I think and just to case make a tease of something they could be working on. My question is. Uh, what is HTC R&D um, making research about? Are you also researching about AR? Or what? Can you tell me something about your research? Not in the details because you can't, but maybe some micro areas of that? No. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the high level thing you know, we've always you know, kept saying is that first of all, uh, we don't see VR and AR as, as, as two separate technologies. They're just really all part of the same continuum, the, 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 the virtuality continuum that's been talked about for the last 20, 30 years. So, um, you know, there, we definitely have people working on AR-related technologies. You know, we have people working on AI-related technologies. We have people working on telecom-related technologies. And all of these things are going to come together uh, on future products that will make it more accessible, make it more comfortable, make it more immersive, uh, make it more intuitive. Right? So, um, you know, I, 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 you know, as you know, we, we can't talk specifics, but uh, you know, all all the, the the key buzzwords out there today in terms of you know exponential technology uh, are things that we are either doing ourselves in terms of research or working with third party uh, in the research firms. Or we're investing in companies uh, who are working on those. So uh, you know, last year, Vivex invested in almost 90 companies uh, around the world, and uh, we're the most active investor uh, for VRAR technology. 
So you know, all of those companies that are part of our ecosystem are also essentially part of our research arm. Yeah, that's that's great. So you also give some hope to little so young entrepreneurs wanting to experiment. Uh, it's also great for that. So I'm finishing here with the questions of your device and uh, all the NDA stuff. So we can talk about things that you are mostly to talk about, like for instance the China uh, virtual reality market. Uh, mm -hmm. You. Five is a Chinese company, so you are dominating the the Chinese market, so you know that market very well for sure. Um, I read in a past interview of yours that you said um, VR market in China is different because they are mostly mobile headsets because they are cheap. They are more arcades, a lot of more arcades where people go to try VR to play with VR, and there is also um, a more professional use of VR. Um, my question is, are these the only difference with the Western market? And uh, furthermore, do you think that uh, in the end, in five years, for instance, the Western market and the Chinese market will become similar, or they will remain different even with time going by? So what's your vision for the Chinese VR market? Um, I mean, I I think what we're seeing over the last several years is that, you know, uh, for any technology, is that Chinese uh, market is very quick at adop adopting new technologies. Right? They're they're willing to try new things even when they're maybe not as mature. Uh, they're willing to spend more money to buy uh, technology. Uh, you know, so they're, uh, what we're finding is that the the user base for VR today in in China is a little bit more diverse than what you'll see in Western markets. The data that we're seeing is that you know gamers still dominate the majority of people who buy VR in the Western world, uh, whereas uh, you know gamers and consumers are probably just a little over half of the sales that we see uh, in the China market. Right. So there's a lot of businesses, there's schools, there's enterprises, there's government. You know we're getting orders from you know, everything from the military to to travel agencies to, to school districts. Uh, for our product, and um, and of course, you know the arcades that you talked about. So uh, it's it's a little bit more diverse, and I think what we'll find is that you know people will find uses for it that um, maybe weren't the the first choice for for Western uh, businesses. Because here, it's such a competitive market that anything you can do to give yourself an edge uh, and it gives you a return on investment, people will try it. And um, you know, maybe in, in the West, uh, a lot of the, the, the businesses are a little bit more conservative in terms of applying the technology. So, uh, but you know, in the long run, I think everything will start to converge. You know, when you're thinking five years or eight years, um, you know, pretty much if you look at the cars that are being sold here, it's the same cars that are being sold in the rest of the world. The phones are being sold here, the computers that are being sold here are the same as the rest of the world. So, but um, you know, there are right now something like you know, two to four hundred brands for VR devices in China, and there's probably maybe one tenth of that in the Western market. So, um, you know, uh, there will be consolidation and there will be winners and losers. Um, but the, when things mature, it, it will always go back to China. The top two or three companies control 70 80 percent of the market of any of any industry. Okay, uh, so you also think that maybe in the end, I don't know, we will we will all use the same kind of devices. So maybe in five years we both in China and the Western world we use standalones, for instance. Well, I mean, I, I, I think there there will always be a market for people who will really want the best experience to have, you know, kind of PC based or more, you know, uh, professional based solutions, right? But uh, you know, for the mass market, I, I think standalone is a trend that will become the the mass market product. Right. So it's, it's something like you know, I, I can I can go and buy a Ferrari for a million dollars, but there aren't that many people that can go do that. But it, it, you know, if you want to sell a million million cars, it's going to be a sedan or it's going to be a coupe. Right. So it's um, you know, there there is always a market for high end and. Um, but you know, which represents the best experience in, in any industry, but it, it won't be the mass market. 
Okay. <laughs> and talking about you talked about um, the competi high competition that is in China. Um, a lot of Western companies that are interested in the obviously in the bigger China market. Uh, my question is, how can a Western VR or AR company be successful in China? So, what what can be its feature to have a success in China for a, an external company? Um, actually, this morning I just had a chat with our U.S. Uh, Vivex company about uh, how to be successful in, in China, and uh, I, I wrote a, a one-page presentation that had 12 keys, and I said, if you think about these 12 keys and do them right you will be uh, successful, you will have a, a good chance to be successful in China. Um, but um, why don't I, I'll send you that slide and uh, you can share, but it, 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 it's not necessarily self-explanatory. So, um, but if you have questions on it, let me know. But it, it is a very uh, difficult market, I think, for foreigners, uh, for foreign companies to, to uh, be successful. And you look at what's happened over the last you know, 20 years with the internet industry here, um, it's pretty much right now still dominated by local companies. You know, uh, when when eBay came and, and Alibaba or you know uh, Taobao came and they started fighting, at the end of the day, you know, they, the, the local company won. When Uber came and there was DB, you know, at the end of the day, DB beat out Uber. Right. So it's, it's a um, you know it, it, it's a place where you need to have local know-how. You have to have a lot of um, flexibility and speed. To, to operate, and you need to, you know, have government and, 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 and local support, and um, you know, to to do that as a foreign company is is uh, it's not easy. Uh, it's doable. I mean, you have companies like Microsoft that's done very well here. Boeing has done very well here. Uh, you know, McDonald's has done very well here. Kentucky Fried Chicken, whatever, right? So, um, but it, it's not a uh, it's not a, a, a simple formula that whatever is successful in the West will be successful in China. Okay, so maybe the best is to find a local partner that can help in understanding the market and execute better for China market. Yeah, I think I think having a local partner is very helpful. Um, also, uh, having the patience to work in China because China. Uh, to, to build the foundation, the relationship you need to be successful, it takes a lot of time. And if you're too rushed, and a lot of Western business people are very in a rush when they come, they'll come in for a, you know a two-day trip, and then they expect to have all the deals done, and then uh, you know they will be successful. And it, it doesn't work that way. And if you only do helicopter management, it just doesn't work here. Okay, so. Another question is that at the beginning of this new renaissance of VR, we were all looking to the U.S. Oculus is a U.S. company, Facebook is a U.S. company, Valve is a U.S. company, uh, and also for AR, we have HoloLens, Magic Leap, and a lot of products are also U.S. first. I think that when I see the device focus and I think that was China first product, a product that we we all from all over the world were interested to was for the first time China first. Um, so I think that there is being a little shift of attention not only towards the U.S. but also towards China. And my question is, what is the ambition of China? It is to supersede the U.S. and so became like the the core, the VR core of this world. <laughs> uh, what is the ambition? Well, of China? I, I think you know the a ambition. Everybody always wants to do the best they can, uh, and you know China as a as a country as a region uh, has definitely grown in influence, uh, both in terms of economic power globally as well as uh, technology prowess and innovation. You know, China used to be seen as the manufacturing base or uh, a copycat country, but what we're finding now is that there's a lot of real innovation coming out of this, uh, this country. Um, and you know, because of the, what I believe will be the faster adoption of the technology in this market, uh, there will be solutions here that will be more innovative than what's happening uh, in the rest of the world. I mean, for instance, last week, uh, you know, Pimax uh, showed off their 8K uh, VR devices. I mean, they're still in, in early, you know, a kind of pre-production stage. Yeah. But you know, the, the having the, the the first 8K devices being a a Chinese manufacturer and a, a Chinese startup. 
you know, that, that's the kind of thing that I think uh, will be increasingly more common going forward, right? Um, and, you know, we're, we're finding that, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest market for almost every consumer product in the world is China. So if it's going to be the biggest production market, the biggest consumer market, and one of the leading innovation markets, uh, it would be very natural for us to put uh, a greater emphasis to be uh, successful in this market. Okay, and about this very successful, this very big world, we were asking about also the, the VR, metaverse, etc. But there is a problem with China is that we know, for instance, when we have to message with a smartphone, when I have to chat with my Western friend, I have to use Telegram, when I have to chat with Chinese, I have to use WeChat. And my question is, if you think that it's possible in VR that we have a common uh, social VR space shared by all the world, or if probably we have another segmentation like a WeChat VR for Chinese users and, I don't know, uh, VR chat for Western world? Um, I mean, I think that, that gets into a more political uh, discussion. <laughs> okay. But, you know, at, at, at the end of the day right now, the, the Chinese government uh, wants to have a greater sense of control over uh, social networking and the, and the kind of the, the messaging and media space, right? That's been a, a general philosophy of the government over the last you know, several decades. So I, I don't see that changing. Um, but, you know, what you also find is that not everything is always blocked, right? Uh, actually, WhatsApp works very well here, as, as it does in the rest of the world. Um, you know, of course, you can use WeChat here, and WeChat actually can also be used in the rest of the world. Yeah. So if you're using uh, WeChat, um, you know, there's no reason why uh, a, a Western user, user couldn't use it. So um, it, there, there probably, I think there probably will be apps that will work uh, in the social space globally. Um, but maybe some of the, the most leading Western apps may not work in China. So uh, if, if, uh, if and when China becomes more important to the overall, uh, you know, global ecosystem, then it may actually make sense for a lot of Western users to start using uh, some of these um, Chinese apps or Chinese uh, social networks. And then you can create a, a global network. So maybe uh, you know maybe Tencent or or uh, Alibaba uh, could be the the, the future you know, global social network. Hope so. I use WeChat for instance. <laughs> also here in the West, it works it works very well, of course. Well, yeah, yeah. Very few people in Italy have WeChat. Some people don't even don't even know that it exists, for instance. So it's not yeah, weird. Yeah. But I mean, you know, Tencent is a company that is, uh, you know, I think very close or may, may have actually overtaken uh, Facebook in terms of total market cap. Right? But a lot of companies, a lot of people don't know them. They're, they they aren't out there doing a lot of marketing for their, their company. You know, they, 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 but they make a great product that has, uh, I think, you know, daily active and uh, like seven, eight hundred million users a day or something. So it, it's crazy, you know, uh, but a lot of people don't know them. Yeah, um, and you'll, 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 you'll find that's the case with a, a lot of the, the, the Chinese companies that they aren't very good at uh, brand marketing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that a lot of... Uh, with WeChat in Chinese, it's possible to do almost everything. I think that maybe it's the only use that <laughs> Chinese smartphones because you can book taxis, you can pay things, you can chat with friends. It's, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah, and then China is probably the first cashless society. I, I can use my phone and pay for everything I need when I go out. I don't need to bring my wallet anymore. I don't even need to bring a credit card. Right? Yeah, they, so, they told me that now you have QR codes. But a people, a person told me that he went to China and only paid with QR codes. So <laughs> it's pretty strange for me that I also use banknotes and such. Mostly, but wow. Yeah, I mean, for, for, for a country that 10 years ago uh, wouldn't take credit cards and you have to bring stacks of cash everywhere you go, now it's uh, you know, the first major market to, to, to essentially eliminate the need for cash. Wow. Um, a popular question that people make, and also investors sometimes ask. I've investors ask me this question, so I'm asking it to you because you're really inside the VR world. Is 
when we are will take off, when will be the right moment to invest in VR for an investor, since you are an investor yourself, and when it will become profitable. I think that 2019 will be the year for the start of the takeoff, so the real change of the uh, market. Uh, what's your opinion about this? So when we are will take off, will it be profitable? Well, I think those are two different questions. One is, you know, when will it take off? And then the other question you said is, when should they invest? Right? Yes. Um, and, and investors should always invest ahead of the market. <laughs> if an investor, if an investor invests it when the market is hot, uh, they will probably lose money. Okay. So, um, you know, they, they, if they wanted to, if, if, if what you're saying is right, that 2019 is the year they should take, it would take off, then they should have invested two or three years ago, okay. because usually, usually the the uh, the exit cycles for startups is between four to seven years, yeah. right? Um, so if uh, you know the companies that will be successful uh, are, I mean, you know, will be the the future, you know, Facebooks and Googles or Alibabas and, and Tencent, and they were always started within the first couple of years of that that new trend or that new industry. You know, uh, you know, Apple and Intel and and uh, Microsoft, they all started, you know, within relatively, you know, short period, uh, close periods of, of, of you know, each other. You know. So when when those things happen, it's like there's this uh, renaissance of, of new innovation. And, uh, you know, the companies that got the, 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 the head start, the ones that got the initial investment, they got a chance to get the best people and they become the, the future leaders. And a lot of times, the, the transition happens where the, the past leaders go away. You know, um, I would imagine that in in 10, 20 years, uh, most of the companies that are in the top 10 uh, will no no longer be in the top 10 uh, of the of the world in terms of technology. If you look at, I actually sent, uh, I published something or, or I, I reposted yes. a, a picture yeah, of how, you know, 50, 50, 50 years ago. Uh, and now, and actually 100 years ago, 50 years ago, now in the top uh, you know, 20 or, or, or 30 companies in, in the, the, the U.S. stock market. And they were essentially completely changed, except I think for one company, which was ExxonMobil, uh, which used to be Standard Oil. That, had, that, that was the only company that lasted all three cycles. Yeah, that's what's impressive. I remember seeing the picture. I was like, wow. So you you have a successful company. Maybe in 20 years you have nothing more <laughs> because it has been a disruptive innovation, and so you're not that important anymore. That that's the thing. And so when we are will take off, in your opinion, that's the second question. Um, I, I I think you're right that 2019 will be a year when we start seeing real momentum. Uh, you know, but for what you to get to the, the, the ubiquity, ubiquity type levels of, of what we see from today, it will probably take somewhere between, you know, five to seven years, I would say. Uh, it took, it took the cell phone, uh, about, you know, seven years to get to, you know, kind of the billion uh, devices a year type of, of mark. So, um, you know, I, I think it will be similar timeline to, to make uh, VR happen as well. Uh, although there, there is a chance, I think, when it does uh, get to a much you know, lighter, uh, lighter form factor uh, and more functionality, we will definitely be more dependent on it than we are on our phones today. You know, if you look at the amount of time we spend on our phones, it's probably an average of, let's say, two to three, four hours a day, which is very significant. But there's still 20 hours a day that we're not on our phones. But when, when VR and AR become our primary device, Essentially, that device will be, you know, on your head, uh, probably for about 16 hours a day. <laughs> wow! At the moment, I imagine a big motion sickness. I mean, my VR headset for 16 hours a day. <laughs> well, not necessarily. I, I think that the, the VR headset or the, the VR AR device of that period will not be the same devices we have today, right? And it will look probably a lot closer to what glasses are, and uh, it, it will become. Uh, you will forget you're wearing it, and it will it will become an AR device when you need it. It will become a VR device when you want it. Right. So that's it's um, the, the the usage model will be very very different. Um, you know, when uh, when ten years ago when you know people 
first started talking about about smartphones, nobody knew that we would depend on that device more than we would depend on any other device we have today. Um, but I think we will de be even more dependent on this new device because it doesn't just give us an interface to the world, it actually can replace your world. It can replace every aspect of it. You know, it can replace your car, it can replace your window, it can replace every screen that you play with. And um, you know, the, the, the level of impact it will have on our future uh, interface to each other and to, to machines uh, will be more dramatic than any other uh, device we've ever interacted with. Wow, the, the, it would be an amazing future for sure. I, I also uh, had a listened to your uh, talk at TEDx Shanghai, and oh. that part about uh, brain inter possible future with brain interface, neural link. Uh, I really want to be still alive when we be that kind of brain connection with AI, VR, AR. All together with our brain, we become cyborgs. I think that <laughs> it would be awesome. Well, I mean, I, I think you know, for a lot of people, when they hear that, they, they think that's a very scary feature. Right? Um, but you know, right now, you know, if you look at before, when uh, when you had a uh, a heart problem, and you said, "Hey, I'm going to put a machine in there to take over and replace your heart," uh, you know. <coughs> Before that, that would have sounded very strange a hundred years ago. That nobody would would thought that was possible. But now you just put a machine in, you can replace almost every organ in your body, right? Um, if if you know you can go in and do LASIK and make your make your uh, myopathy disappear, and you can have perfect vision. Essentially, what what um, you know when you put these future devices on, not only do they replace and make your uh, vision better or your other things better, it actually makes you smarter. It, it makes you have perfect memory, right? Right now, we spend most of our time in school memorizing things. If you didn't have to do that anymore, if, if you can have access to every piece of information available anywhere instantly, you know, why do we need to memorize, right? And so it turns us into a super intelligent being. Yeah. That's, that's actually uh, you know, quite amazing. And, and, and when everybody can be super intelligent, the kind of problems that we have as a society today will actually go away because we're going to find a creative solution that, that solves it in a way that, you know, still allows us to maintain a sustainable uh, planet, which is actually one of the biggest concerns we should be, uh, you know, as a, as a species trying to solve. Wow. <laughs> Um, talking about investments again, a uh, very short answer about what is the most important thing that you look uh, before deciding if investing in a VR startup. So if VR startup is looking, is watching this video, uh, sometimes say the team, others say the idea, what's, what's your most important thing in a startup, in a VR startup? I mean, I, at the end of the day, a VR startup is the same as any other startup, right? You're, you, you need to make sure that you're solving a problem that needs solving, that people are willing to pay for, and you're qualified to solve it, right? And when you do solve it, that it, it is significantly better than anything out there so that people will actually, you know, buy your product. Now, um, if you don't meet those, any of those criteria, and you actually don't necessarily care about the problem that you're trying to solve, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. You know, if you're just saying, hey, I heard VR is hot, I'm going to go do a VR startup, you're probably going to fail, right? But if you say, hey, I'm, you know, the best in the world at solving whatever it is, uh, and if I apply VR to it, I can solve that thing better, I can make it cheaper or faster or more comfortable, then, then you should go and try that, right? So, do something that you already know. Do something that, that you are already a, a, an expert in, and then apply this technology to see how you can disrupt that industry that you already know well. I think those are the, the entrepreneurs that are going to be successful, not the opportunistic ones that, that will always chase the next shiny object. Okay. <clears throat> and the new year has just begun, so what's HTC goal for 2019, and what's your personal goal for this year? <laughs> Uh, what's my goal, you said? Or? Yeah, personal goal for 2019. What, what, what do you want to achieve in this year? And what HTC wants to achieve in this year? 
Uh, well, I think personally, I, I want to see uh, the standalone really take off. I, I want to see um, applications for the technology in ways that we never imagined, and that it starts to show real significant uh, adoption uh, beyond beyond entertainment. Uh, that's what I want. To see. Um, I think for the company, you know, we really want to make sure that we continue to to strengthen our leadership in industry. You know, we are uh, and have been the company that that you know is leading and pushing the industry forward with uh, the most amount of innovation and the best experience and the and the the, the you know, most immersive content. And you know, we want to continue to do that. We want to make sure that this entire ecosystem uh, progresses as quick as possible. And we provide the the best product and platform out there, so that people can uh, can enjoy this new technology. Because I really believe that that VR will change the world, and, and I believe that we're you know I'm in the company that has the potential to make that happen. So. Yeah, because I also think that in 2017, uh, the VR reputation has dropped a lot, was in the tour of disappointment. So I really hope that in 2018, uh, people will start believing again in VR. Because we had a lot of hype, then we went down yeah. in 2017, I hope that we start. Yeah, I mean, I, I think with, with any new technology, there's always that cycle, right? That's the, uh, the, the Gartner uh, yeah. adoption. <laughs> So, um, but if you if you look at the the, the latest Garner uh, chart, you know uh, VR is actually the the only technology that has gotten past the the cross of this illusion and is is on a path up, you know, uh, to where you know it, it's getting to a more sustained growth. So um, the the industry, I think, probably people over expected uh, had 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 over expectations. And so whenever your expectation exceeds reality. You become disappointed. So um, you know now I think what's happening is that technology is now catching up to expectations, and uh, I think in the near future it actually will exceed expectations. Uh, I, 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 there was one one demonstration I, I saw at CES, which uh, I was quite impressed with, was uh, six degrees of freedom video. So yeah. video where you can walk inside and you, it's not CG, it's actually video, but you can you can walk around in the video. I mean, that's something that I, I didn't expect to be available so quickly, but it, it actually, you know, I, I, I physically demonstrated it and it worked. And, you know, in fact, uh, it's very likely that that technology will be demonstrated on a standalone device very soon. And uh, so when, when that happens, I think it will change entertainment and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and um, live streaming and, and sports uh, viewing, all of that dramatically. In fact, it will probably make uh, video conferencing obsolete. We, you know, in the future, we should not be looking at a 2D screen when we do these kind of interviews. We should be looking at a immersive 360 or, or a a three a six DOS video, so that I can actually get up to you and close to you and, and either, you know give you a high five or uh, something else. Right? Yeah. So that that that's where you know this technology. I, that was something I would have not expected so quickly, but now it's actually something that's commercializable uh, in the very immediate future. Uh, we are almost close to the end. I wanted to ask you, uh, I, I also say that I appreciate uh, to uh, have a, an attitude that I like, for instance, on social media, you're very open, you talk a lot to people, you answer questions. I want to ask you, uh, what's the right attitude to um, to have success in. Um, I'm, I'm I'm sorry, the the connection is really bad. The, can can you repeat your question? I didn't hear anything you just said. The connection is really okay. Bad. Now can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit better. Yeah, can you say again? Uh, I said that uh, I appreciate your attitude on social media, um, answering people, uh, making a lot of uh, also a lot of. Speaking about VR, to talk people about how VR is awesome. Uh, I see also a lot of passion in what you do. Uh, my uh, my question is, uh, what what's your um, what do you think is the right attitude to reach success 
uh, in life. So, for instance, you are now president of HTC Vive China. You're trying to change the world. So, how do you get there? How people should behave to reach similar success? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the the reason I I work uh, so hard and diligently to 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 support VR uh, and this growth is because it's something that I really believe in. Right? I think at, at the end of the day, for anybody to be successful, for anybody to to go, you know, change the world, as, as you say, is they have to believe in something and they have to have. Something. And, and once a person finds their purpose, uh, you know, even if they work 20 hours a day, they won't feel tired. And, and I can say, you know, from my own experience, that's absolutely true. And, you know, I, I, I first experienced VR about 26 years ago uh, at the first lab doing VR research in, in, uh, in uh, non-military VR research in the U.S. And, you know, to, to, to see the progress of this industry over that period, uh, it's amazing. And I'm so glad that now, uh, you know, there is the possibility for that technology to, to be accessible to the general public. And you know, having seen it then, and seeing the potential now that, that um, it will have in changing our future, uh, it gives me that energy, right? And I think if, if, if no matter what startup you're doing or what job you're doing, or you know, uh, what your educational background is, none of that really matters until you find something you believe in. And when you do, mm -hmm you will find the way to, to, uh, to have the biggest impact, right? So that, that's really the, the, the key for me is, is um, understanding your goal as a person. You know, why do you exist here on Earth? And what can you do with the time, the limited time that we all have? Uh, once you find it, uh, you will find uh, the, the motivation to, to be successful. And then there's all the, the basic things you do in terms of working hard and education and discipline and, and then, you know, being responsible and, and all those other things. Okay, now the last question is the same question I ask in all the interviews. It's an open question. Is there is something that I haven't asked you but you really want to say to people about whatever you want. There is something that you want to add to this interview? Maybe something that you would really want to say that people never ask you. <laughs> um, I, I think we've already talked quite a bit, um, but if, if uh, I guess if I'm going to leave you with one thing, I may actually repeat the question that I, I said at the TEDx uh, uh, speech about you know a month ago, is that you know if you lived in a world where money and location didn't matter anymore, and you you could have anything you want, and you could be anywhere you want. You know, would you spend your time? Would you still spend your time doing the thing that you are today, or would you be doing something else? And if you can answer that question, um, I think it will help you a long way toward knowing you know whether you're spending your time in the right things and what you would actually want to do and what is the thing that you're most passionate about. And if you can find that passionate thing. Uh, I think it will uh, change the path uh, of you know what you will do with the time that you do have left on the third. Okay, wow. Uh, and that's it for this interview. Uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you, Mr. Wang, for this opportunity, and goodbye.